I noticed you used the unicursal hexagram on several of your videos. Do you consider yourself a Tholemite? No, I don't. However, that's not to say that there aren't valuable things that can be taken from it. But I'm just as inclined to use the traditional hexagram as the unicursal hexagram. Being a solitary practitioner, I've become more of a hodgepodge of many traditions and systems, taking things of value from a lot of them. There's no real one group that I identify with 100%. I found it best to carve my own path first, reaching my own conclusions, and then look to see if there is a group that I strongly identify with, instead of finding a group first and then following the path that they set for you. So the question becomes, is there a group that Prater identifies with that has many of the conclusions that I've reached and taught. Surprisingly, yes there is. So, let's get into it. Now again, there's no one group that I identify 100% with. But in this particular case, it scores about 75 to 80%, which is pretty high for me. And I'm talking about Rosicrucianism. Now, I came across the video, you can tell it's a bit older, on a presentation of basic Rosicrucianism. If you wish to watch the entire video, it's a bit long, but I'll put a link here and in the description. But I'm going to be taking a few snippets of this video, and we're going to see if it doesn't sound like the same things that old Prater Xavier has been teaching and telling you. Keeping in mind that I've reached the same conclusions myself beforehand by doing the work before looking in the Rosicrucianism or what any other groups are teaching. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be on the Rosicrucian Science of Initiation. There are many different spiritual systems in the world that have different types of initiation programs that a person goes through. And the Rosicrucian system is one that's been very influential in the West, but actually it's sometimes hard to get information about what their actual system of development is. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Robert Gilbert. I've been involved in Rosicrucian studies for about 25 years. In one of these, what is actually being illuminated begins with the thinking process. This is linked to the spiritual centers inside the head. And this is also linked to the illumination of the thinking process. This is because in this path of illumination, we find that everything is a thought form from the mind of God. So it all begins understanding the whole set of processes by understanding where everything comes from. In the ancient Greek times, they talked about the source of all being with the name of The One, in capital letters, The One. And this is a beautiful representation within sacred geometry that everything comes from a unified source. But everything comes from the unified source of The One. It's all creation from the mind of God. And in the classical Western work from Greece and elsewhere, they talk about thoughts in the mind of God being the source of everything. And that's what Plato referred to as ideal types or ideal thought forms. These are actually what construct the world. These thoughts in the mind of God take on different separate qualities and different separate functions in the world, and then they manifest through the different planes. It's understood from the classical Western Hermetic, as above, so below, tradition, of which Rosicrucianism is one of the most recent expressions, that the nature of the mind of God is essentially pure consciousness. Everything is based on a field of pure consciousness. You find the exact same teaching in the ancient Vedic text and many other world traditions. Consciousness is the basis. But the key thing for the Rosicrucians is that these patterns, everything in the world comes directly from the one, from the mind of God. So what he's talking about here is the first hermetic principle of mentalism, that everything comes from source, everything comes from the one. 
And if you want to learn more about that, you could read the Kabbalion by the Three Initiates, which covers the seven hermetic principles. But although everything comes from the mind of God, as the microcosm to the macrocosm, your own individual reality comes from you, or at least a very large part of it. If you remember the Garden of Eden story, when the serpent tempted Eve to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he told her that they would become like God. And so, for better or worse, we have this inherent ability to shape our own realities with our mind, specifically impressing our conscious will upon our subconscious mind. It's both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing for those who understand it, and it's a curse for those who do not, which most people do not. We shall continue. So the Tree of Life holds a tremendous amount of embedded information. There's another pattern that's laid within the Tree of Life, which is that it has three different pillars inside of it. Now the three pillars have an interesting quality to them. On the left and the right hand pillars, which are sometimes referred to in the West as the pillars of mercy and severity, they don't go all the way up or all the way down. The only one that goes all the way up and all the way down is the central or the middle pillar. Well, the problem is, as we are created from the Godhead, the first movement from the one is into the two. It's like the first split of the egg in the mother's womb to be the two different parts that will then split to become the full manifest human being. So that split into two is actually taking the unified aspect of the Godhead, the One, and moving into two opposite polarities. In the Indian tradition, they talk about this being Shiva and Shakti, these archetypal yin and yang, masculine and feminine aspects. Now this is absolutely critical because you can't say that one is good and one is bad. You can't have a purely polarized system and say that's good, that's bad. If we have male and female, which one's good and which one's bad? But this type of thinking infects everything in the Western world today, like our politics. Well, if this side is right, that side must be wrong sort of thing. Everything is brought into this polarized dichotomy. But the original understanding was much different. If we study classical teachings like in Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about you know, the path of development is not to one extreme or another. It's the middle way. It's that central path, holding a balance between two different extremes. And so the same thing is true on the Tree of Life. We have a middle path, just like the Tibetans talk about, and then things can go off balance to one extreme or another. You know, do you want to be too hot or too cold? You don't want either, you want to be in the middle. But this applies to everything within spiritual development. The meaning of this is that when we hold to the middle way, perfect balance in all polarities in life, then we're on the path that takes us all the way. But through free will, through the mysteries that are described in the book of Genesis and in the Kabbalah and many other traditions, where through the exercise of free will, we can choose to go off to one direction or the other and get off balance. But that basic idea here is that to one side, you can go, even with any human being, toward a type of spiritual development where you really focus on spirit, but your physical life goes straight to hell. You know, you're not able to pay the bills and your relationships with people suffer and you're not taking care of business and your life's not going that well, but you're really focused on spirit all the time, but not grounded. Now that can also lead, unfortunately, to forms of spirituality that are illusory or hallucinogenic, so that the things that are being perceived and worked with are not really real, or they're distorted through our lens in a particular way that's really not helpful. Now on the other hand, as you might imagine, it's the exact opposite polarity. If one is connecting to spirit, but not really following the th full process of creation in matter and connecting to that, then the other is going to be deeply connected to matter. It's going to be deeply connected to the process of linking onto the uh, physical materialization process and loving physicality. So human beings can fall into this as well by becoming completely materialistic so that we don't even believe that spirit exists. Spirit is some type of illusion that we have. There's nothing but random evolution over time through completely physical biological processes and there is no spirit, there's nothing of that kind. And then, of course, things that are more of a grounded nature to the central pillar. So then when we go through a process of initiation, initiation is really a process of becoming aware of who am I? Why am I here? Where do I come from? 
Uh, and how do I develop a process by which I can become more self-aware and accelerate my process of development? Now, there's a very important uh, thing that comes in in Rosicrucianism that I like a lot at this point, which is that along the path of initiation, as you begin to understand processes other people don't understand, that can be the temptation to use that knowledge to manipulate other people or to manipulate all types of things. Let's say you understand psychology and somebody else doesn't. You can manipulate them with all types of things in neurolinguistic programming and things of that kind. What words do you use? What tonality do you use? How do you present the information? You can manipulate them all over the place. And so in Rosicrucianism, there's a very strong rule that all the powers and understandings gained on the path will be put to the service of other people. And so that's like the first rule in Rosicrucianism. Otherwise, you develop the abilities, you will get that temptation of, well, I could get what I want right now because they don't understand this process, but I do. Okay, so here's where we're going to have a slight point of contention. While I agree that you shouldn't be manipulating and duping people and using your newfound occultic powers for strictly selfish aims, and you should be putting them towards serving others, in most cases, you are going to have to help yourself before you can help others to get you into a position to be able to serve others. You know, he just got done talking about keeping things in balance and the importance of it. But this is one of those things that needs to be kept in balance as well. In fact, it's very difficult for you to serve yourself without serving others. Providing service to others is one of the keys to wealth. And the more you acquire the more influence you have, and the better you can serve others. It's a symbiotic relationship. I'm pretty sure they know this given everything else that they know, and they're just saying this up front to ward off anybody that may have only personal motives. But the reality is, the more you help yourself, the more you can help others, and the more you help others, the more you help yourself. The initial concept is that the Christ being is the actual higher consciousness aspect that is a living being at a higher macrocosmic level that every human being is connected to. It's not something for one particular set-aside group of people. Some might be more conscious of it than others, but from the perspective of a Rosicrucian, you can find people that are more deeply connected to Christ than uh, someone that says they're Christian, who are Buddhist, Hindus, whatever. It has to do with their illumination of consciousness and what they're resonant with. So again, the seven I am sayings of the book of John are understood by the Rosicrucians not to be that you have to pledge some type of loyalty to Jesus Christ as a kind of master in order to not be tortured or to die forever, but rather it's a matter of the I am is the way and the light. The I am is the resurrection and the life. That it's that spark of the divine inside of us that's of the exact same nature as the Christ being. There is no separation between them. They're both emanation from the same ocean of fire. That's the consciousness of God. Now, as it transforms our consciousness, we have to start with, and now we're getting onto the road of what is Rosicrucian initiation about and why is it done this way, to first start to uh, analyze our own internal life. We have to be aware of what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? Because most of the time we're completely unconscious. These are the kind of things that you find in many traditions, like in the work of Gurdjieff. If you look at the foundations of Gurdjieff's work, he talks about the fact that the terror of the situation, in his terms, is that the whole human race is asleep. We think we're awake and we're walking around in the world, but we're still fast asleep and we just keep playing out the same reactive psychological patterns again and again and again. So we have to go through a process that he calls waking up and becoming self-aware. And so we start simply observing ourselves. So the process of self-observation is fundamental in just about all classical initiation traditions. Without self-observation, you can't begin to crystallize out this level of awareness. And you can't start changing your detrimental psychological patterns of how you think and how you speak and how you interact with people and how you feel internally to something that's more beneficial. But at the highest level of expanding our consciousness, we get to the point that we know that we're connected to everything that is. And that's what you find in Tibetan Buddhism. And that's the type of transpersonal Christ consciousness that we're talking about here. There's nothing separate in us from the sentient nature of all beings. It all comes from the unified Godhead. Now that I am self-awareness can begin to transform our consciousness. So our detrimental thinking patterns, where we think very negatively 
and we ascribe all types of, of uh, angry and negative types of uh, aspects to the people around us and to the things of the world around us. We can begin to transform that and illuminate it. Again, then we transform the life body and transform the physical body. So the first thing we have to do is like what Gurdjieff talked about. We have to begin to self-observe. We have to observe ourselves through the course of the day. We have to observe what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? That act in itself, something always also described by the Buddhist in great detail, will actually begin to use the light of our consciousness to illuminate the thinking process, to illuminate our feeling process and our willing process. What this allows us to do is we can then begin to see how much of what we go through every day internally is completely unconscious. It's just one reactive state after another. You get a particular external trigger and you have a particular reaction to it. And so this is the foundation. If you did this, you would end up reaching the goal if you did nothing else. If you don't do this, nothing else you do will matter. You have to do the self-observation and once you can illuminate, let's say, your thinking process, then because you can now recognize that moment at which you start to go unconscious. But actually looking into the soul nature of the person. What is the divine core of that person? Even if the person's acting out in a way that we can't stand them, we can try to look past that to see there's a divine core in this person and we ask ourselves the grail question of brother or sister, what ails thee? You went through some type of suffering to be able to manifest yourself in this non-skillful way in the world that I find difficult to interact with. But it's based on suffering. That's why the Buddhists talk about, you know, all life is suffering, everyone has suffered. The only way to get past anger and to forgive your enemies is to understand that your enemies suffer too. So, as a practical matter, when you study spiritual science, you understand different levels of consciousness, different spiritual planes, different human subtle bodies, the evolution over great periods of time. Those actually put a structure in your consciousness that allow higher spiritual beings to tell you more. It's like if you had to run up on somebody and you're trained in physics and they're not, and you've got to tell them something that they can do that would really help people. You can have a hard time trying to find the words about, okay, now you've got to do this and that, if they don't know the concepts. It's the same thing here. Higher spiritual beings can give us information about what we need to do with our lives to help other people, all kinds of great processes. If we have the core concepts to begin with that they can work with, otherwise it's really hard to communicate with us in a way that moves up to their level. So the study of spiritual science is to actually lay down contextual foundations in our thinking, in our mind, that these spiritual beings can then come in and when we're meditating or we're relaxed, all of a sudden things start to click internally. We get these downloads that happen in a second. We begin to see how all these things fit together. But we can't have it without having the things planted in place first, without having the context first. So it's not just an intellectual thing, it lays the foundation for the spiritual beings to come and show us how it all fits together and how we can apply it. You have it as an internal knowledge inside of you. It's no longer outside, it's inside. Now this is absolutely the case. A lot of my knowledge comes from accessing these downloads. It's a big reason I came to a lot of the same conclusions and can follow along and know exactly what he's talking about. But I do have some slight points of contention um, you know, he's talking like you need to be like really developed in order to access these things. And just like anything, it may take a little practice. But really, all you need to do is meditate. You know, meditate on what it is you want to know. And then let it go. So that the solution may come to you. It may come to you while you're meditating. It may come to you just out of nowhere. But it works a lot like magic. You set your intention and you meditate on it. And then when you release that expectation and let it go and you're not thinking about it, then it will come to you. But you do need to have a meditation practice. Whether or not these answers come from higher spiritual beings or the subconscious mind is a debate for another time. But the point is, is that I am not privy to any information that you can't access yourself. And this is one of the things I don't like about groups in general, <laughs> is it's like, well, yeah, you come to us, and once you reach a certain level of development, then you'll be able to start accessing information and knowledge 
and we'll show you how so that you're dependent upon us and no you can actually start doing this today right now if you wanted to but yes the knowledge downloads that he's talking about do exist they do happen but you don't have to be super overdeveloped to start accessing them but you do need a meditation practice so uh Alspensi then began to realize this entire process to where we're rarely completely conscious and it's hard to stay self-aware. And he began to be aware of that threshold between uh, being fully conscious and going to sleep. And that's absolutely critical. So that in our thinking process, it's like I've got my good spiritual persona on and I'm open-hearted and I'm dealing with everybody in a beneficial way and good for me. And then something happens and somebody speaks to me in a way that triggers some emotional response. And then I literally go unconscious and I just respond to them reactively. And the goal is to start seeing that particular boundary point where I go unconscious and catching myself before I pass out. I stay conscious, I stay thinking, and I stay rational. And it's much harder to do than it sounds. And it's that much harder to do with the feeling and the willing because those are already less conscious than our thinking is. But when we begin to see how much negative feeling we actually harbor about other people and all the things in the world, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> the Rosicrucians are really strong about not getting stuck in one way of seeing things. So everything that Rosicrucians teach is not dogmatic. Because if it's dogmatic, it's one perspective and this is the only true perspective and it's not seen that way here. The openness is to be able to see things from multiple perspectives. And the more perspectives you have, the closer you get to its reality. Like the blind men and the elephant. You're stuck with a spear and a pillar and whatever else until you see all the different perspectives and you know, hey, it's an elephant. By the same token here, this has to do with the uh, particular soul capacity that Steiner refers to as being able to walk a circle around anything in our lives, around any subject. And in walking the circle, we need to see it from 12 different perspectives. And in a way, that's what the world religions are. They're walking a circle around a central reality and seeing it from different perspectives. Not one is right and one is wrong. It's walking the circle and seeing from an opposite perspective of yours, and you see more of the totality of what's held in the center. Now, it was also, <coughs> called, it was also called equanimity because it has to do with not having emotional reaction <coughs> to other ideas or things that come up. And so there's a certain stability that comes with us. We're open to things, but we also have a very stable internal soul life. <coughs> we don't fall into reactivity. Because for anyone here that's done emotional process work, which is probably the majority of people here, you know that the reactive mind and reactivity is a thing that constantly brings us down. And the last part is simply to harmonize all this together, the harmony of all aspects. Because when you're not used to doing this, you've got to focus on one thing at a time. Okay, today I'm focusing on observing my thinking. Today I'm observing my feeling, etc. But once it's become second nature, all of this needs to flow into a complete totality that you don't even think about. This is the foundation and the background for doing the deeper work. We're in that stage of development where as we move further down our lives, we'll end up developing certain sets of skills, understandings, knowledge. And so this is linked to the whole concept that over time, the things that cause us the most pain in life sometimes become the source of our greatest strengths. And that's something I can certainly attest to, having to have gone through so much stuff and come out the other side in order to be a guide for others going through the same things. Because most of us are on an independent spiritual path where we are self-initiating. We might train with different people, etc. But most of us don't have one guru that tells us everything to do. Because of that, we learn a lot of different practices, a lot of different meditations, and we have to choose which ones am I going to do with my limited amount of time and energy on a regular basis. Because those are going to change our destiny, choosing which ones to do. So at the end of the practices that we do here, I always have people check in for a moment before they come out of the practice. And I say, ask yourself the silent question, how has this practice structured my consciousness and my body of energy? And you need to check in anytime you do any practice and see what structures it's creating in you. 
you can actually feel something energetically beginning to form inside of yourself. Or you can feel your consciousness taking on a particular perspective by these things. And for one person, that particular set of practices might be great. For another, it might not be the most effective way for them to get to the goal that they're going to. Yes, we all need to find our own path. Are you starting to see the results from the changes that you've been making, whether it be from this channel or from any other practice that you may have? You know, I'm pleased to say that I get success stories sent to me almost every day from those who have integrated what I've taught into their lives. But I've also said at the beginning that this path isn't the only path, and it's not for everyone. But regardless of which path you take, you should always strive to do your best and become the highest version of yourself that you can possibly be. So in closing, I just want to say that while I'm not 100% in agreement with everything that was presented in this video on Rosicrucianism, there is a lot of it that I do agree with, that I have come to the same or similar conclusions. That's not to say that there aren't truths and things of value from other traditions and systems. There are, and we all need to find our own path. And it's that balance between spirituality and the material world that's going to make us feel the most complete. And with that, I'm going to close this video out. It has gone on a little longer than most. But I will see you all very soon. And until then, take care.